Hi everyone and welcome to this short presentation brought to you by the Merseyside Nighthawks. Uh, my name is Andy Taylor, I'm one of the coaches here at the Nighthawks and uh, the, the aim of this presentation is to try and introduce those who are new to the sport to the, the basic principles of American football. Um, we, we hope that by the end of this and along, along with the other catalogue of online resources that we're going to develop over the next few months, uh, by the time you show up on day one with us, uh, you'll have a nice platform to, to be going with um, once, you, once you start hitting the, uh, getting into training and stuff like that. Those of you who have played uh, American football before or know or have followed the sport for a little while might find this uh, as a helpful refresher, uh, but I'd expect you to know most of it. What we're going to do is we're going to try and simplify the game of American football into its simplest form for you and introduce you to the basic principles. Uh, one of the most common questions that we get over social media and via email is uh, what position should I play or uh, will you guys help me to find the position that I should play? As most of you will already know that uh, the, the beauty of American football is that uh, any size uh, can play, any size or shape can fit, play this game, uh, whether you're five foot six or six foot six, or whether you're 25 stone or 12 stone. And although, yes, we will uh, try and shepherd you into a position that uh, will suit you the best, uh, principally we start off with uh, trying to find the uh, position that you would like to play first and hopefully by the end of this presentation you'll have a bit more of an idea of where you might fit in the team. Then at the very end we're going to introduce you to the basic uh, pe uh, rules that are involved in American football uh, um, certainly in, in the penalty sort of uh, situation and we'll have a little 10 minute video at the end of that to introduce you to uh, some of the basic rules. So thinking about the, the football field itself to start off with, uh, so every football field is on average uh, 100 yards long. So you can see on the on the diagram there that you've got um, lines that stretch the width of the field every five meet, every five yards. They are separated by one yard hashes in between. And then you'll see every 10 yards is labeled uh, with a number. Uh, some of the, U the, the fields that you'll find in the UK are shortened to 90 yards uh, because we've got to fit in 10 yard end zones on the end of each end of each half as well. Um, and some of the facilities don't uh, allow it for 100 yards plus the end zone. Um, certainly the, the home, home field at the Nighthawks uh, does that in itself as well. Um, so uh, one, once you've once you fit in the 100 yards plus the end zone, you're after obviously 120 yards. Um, what you'll find is a, a terminology that is uh, that is referred to in on an American football field that isn't marked, uh, but it's commonly referred to, um, is the red zone. Uh, so the, the red zone is the final 20 yards of, ev of every half. Uh, it's kind of the, the target uh, that each offense aims for uh, because your likelihood of scoring uh, goes up as soon as you enter the red, red zone red zone as a um, as an offense. You'll also notice that uh, on the field, uh, the, the, the middle of the field, if you imagine the line going down the middle of the field lengthways, um, equal distance away from there are two ha hash marks, um, so lines of hashes. So they are the hash marks. Um, you'll also hear uh, coaches refer to them as the hashes. Um, and they're there because uh, depending on where the last play finishes, will uh, identify where the next play will start. So for instance, if the if the last play went out of bounds on the left-hand side of the field, then uh, the next play will be started on the left-hand hash. And then you'll also see that um, each, each um, uh, all the fields have sidelines and each team occupies one sideline and there will be a marked area for each team to stay in. Um, and we'll touch upon that as to why in a little while, but that's why you see uh, most uh, all the players and coaches congregated on the sideline in American football. The basics of the game is to score more, point, more points than the other team. Uh, two teams involved, uh, which is pretty obvious, uh, but worth stating. Each side, each team has two sides, so offense and defense. Uh, in our game, you do sometimes find people playing both. Uh, both offense and defense in the same game, um, but principally you have two units uh, per side. Uh, you play four quarters per game and each quarter is 15 minutes long, so a total of 60 minutes. Uh, 
and then each offense um, has four attempts to go to cut um, to go ten yards, and each attempt is what we refer to as downs. So you'll hear the terms first down, second down, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and the 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 aim of the game really is for offense to uh, go at least ten yards um, within those four four downs. Uh, obviously, they want to score, uh, but the the the, pr the primary the, the primary aim for each offense is to go the go the ten yards. Um, when the ten yards is reached, the target then moves another ten yards, unless obviously they score within the end zone. And then each team res restarts on first down. So if you consider it like rugby league, where if you don't score um, a try, then you have to give the ball back. This is kind of similar, but you only have to go ten yards. Uh, if the team doesn't make ten yards, then they have to hand it back to the opposition. At the end of every half, uh, something just that's slightly unique to American football. So at the end of every half, which is the second and fourth quarter, there's a timeout taken at two minutes left called the two minute warning. If you consider scoring for a minute, there's plenty of ways that you can score. So you can score uh, via a touchdown, which is either a pass or a run into the end zone. Uh, and that would be six points. At the end, uh, after a touchdown, most teams will then take a PAT, which is a point, af a point after um, attempt. Uh, that's a, a field goal, so a kick that's taken after a touchdown, which will score you one point. Uh, teams can uh, decide to take a field goal, and that's a kick that's usually taken on fourth down, uh, but sometimes not, and that's cut, that's, that'll reward the team with three points if successful. The, alt the, the alternative option um, after, after you score a touchdown other than a PAT is to take a two-point conversion. So that's usually a pass or a run play that is, that, is, that is ran instead of a PAT and that can score you two points. And then there's something else called a safety. So a safety is when the offense is stopped by the defense in their own end zone. So if you imagine a quarterback being tackled in their own end zone, then the defense uh, will be rewarded with two points for their team. There are timeouts in American football as well. So each team will get three 30 second timeouts per half uh, and then you can't gain them back. Uh, but you, you uh, Certainly in our sport, it's different in NFL, uh, but you, you get three 30 second timeouts at each half. And then if you consider fourth down for a minute by itself, Fourth down is probably where things get a bit more complicated when it comes to um, understanding the rules of American football. So if you consider fourth down being the fourth attempt of an offense to be able to try and go 10 yards. So on that fourth down, each team is always um, left with a bit of a dilemma. So do does the team try and score or try and make the 10 yards on the fourth attempt, which obviously could be high risk because if you don't make it, then you're automatically given the the ball over to the opposition where you took that, where you attempted that fourth down. Um, but also the, op uh, the the team with the, on the fourth down also has the opportunity to either attempt a field goal, depending if they're in range, or something called a punt. Um, and a punt is where the team will try and kick and, um, and get the ball as deep into the opposition's half as possible. So to make to basically give the opposition more distance to cover when they um, gain their gain their possession. The clock is something that's quite unique to American football as well. Um, there are two of them, which is something that's uh, quite difficult to get your head around. And also it's probably what adds to the, the start stop. Uh, nature of American football. So the, the clock that we all aim for, which which uh, decides uh, the, the length of the game is called the game clock. And that run, runs continuously for 15 minutes a quarter. It stops when either there's a cut timeout called, when the quarter ends, if there's an incomplete pass, if the ball carrier goes out of bounds, and that can be a running back, a quarterback, or a wide receiver, or, or someone who's carrying the ball, um, a player is injured. If there's a change of possession, um, and also uh, for a referee intervention, but I won't go into what those interventions might be. Alongside the game clock is, is the play clock. So uh, if you've ever watched American football before, you will see on screen, you'll see the, the game clock, which will run down from 15 to zero, and you'll see the play clock, which is in seconds. Uh, an offense has 40 seconds to complete a play. 
Sometimes it's uh, it's 25 seconds, depending on whether there's been a stoppage by the officials or not. But most of the time, it's 40 seconds that they get to complete a play. If they decide if they don't snap the ball before the 40 seconds are up, then that will result in a delay of game. Uh, that will be touched upon at the end in the in the video. But that basically means that there's a five yard penalty for the offense, and they have to re replay that down again. Another another aspect that is unique to American football is the uniform. So um, it's it's mandated that every player on the Ameri on an American football field has to wear a helmet. It has they have to wear shoulder pads, which will usually fit under your jersey, and your jersey is is where where you'll what you'll wear over that. You will then wear um, American football pants, which will have um, spe you know. Uh, that it'll have sections for you to have thigh pads, knee pads, and also a pad that covers your coccyx bone um, at the top uh, at the top of your backside, and then also the footwear. Depending on where where you play, where you're playing, certainly in the in the UK will de de depend on what you what you wear on your sh on your feet. But uh, they, they are commonly referred to as cleats. And you can see on the screen there that uh, the typical jersey number for each uh, position, which we'll go into the positions in a second, uh, we we try and uh, stand by that at the Nighthawks, but it's not it's not mandatory here. Uh, but you can get an an idea as to what sort of uh, numbers we we allocate to different positions. Another unique aspect of American football is the number of officials. So the first comment to make really is that there are a lot more officials in the NFL and college game than there are in Baffa. Um, below, what I'm going to line out, um, outline below is the typical setup for a, a Baffa game. So Baffa stands for British American Football Association. So what you would find when you're playing for the Nighthawks. So there's always a referee. That's the guy in the picture there with the white cap. Uh, he, everyone else wears black, by the way. Um, he has general oversight and control of the game. He's the head official. He has the final say. So there might be a debate on a, on a ruling or or something like that, but he would have final say over that. And they also are their main their main role uh, is to monitor the quarterback at all times. So they will uh, they will monitor for roughing the passer. They'll monitor for uh, for um, anything that the any uh, intervention that the quarterback might might need or any rule that they break um, and then on top of the the referee you've also got the umpires so the umpires tend to uh, you'll either find them in the backfield of uh, the offense <clears throat> or you'll see them uh, lined up close uh, alongside the line of scrimmage so they their their main aim is to watch the line of scrimmage uh, we'll talk about what the line of scrimmage is in a second Linesmen, so you'll have uh, one lineman on each sideline uh, and they, their responsibility is to watch for players um, or the ball going out of bounds and they will mark the progress of the offence to determine where, where the point of the next play will start. In British American football as well, um, sometimes you'll find the linesmen are, um, control the game clock, so the 15 minutes per quarter. The, there is also a back judge, so they will usually line up um, about 20 yards deep on the defensive side. They, they tend to look for either pass interference or fumble recovery, um, but they, they try and keep an eye on what happens down the field in the defensive side of the ball. In Baffa as well, they also uh, tend to be the play clock holder and they tend to signal the quarterback when there's 10 seconds left and they'll hold their hand up in the air to signal to the quarterback that you've got 10 seconds left to, to run your play. So moving on to positions now, and I first want to talk, touch upon the line of scrimmage because I mentioned it a couple of times and it's quite important to understand uh, where, uh, the positions in relation to the line of scrimmage. So the line of scrimmage is where the ball is placed and it's an imaginary line that runs the width of the field. Um, and that, ten, that is the, the, the mark of where the ball is placed and also um, where the offence can't go over before the play and also where the defence can't come over before the, before the play as well. And that will be touched upon in the video at the end as well. So the above uh, diagram is pretty much typical of the NFL um, or college rather than Baffa. We don't tend to see a lot of tight ends used in the in in 
in, in the UK. What you might find is that tight end is either another wide receiver or a fullback. Uh, never say never, you do see them sometimes, but um, a lot of the time that they're not there. So you've obviously got quarterback, a running back, and they sit in the backfield. And the backfield is in relation to the line of scrimmage, so behind the offensive line, behind the, behind the line of scrimmage. You've then got wide receivers that line up um, on the on the perimeters, but also uh, inside the ha inside the hash marks, and they are usually lettered from left to right, so X, Y, and Z, and sometimes you do see a W in there as well. Um, you do have tight ends, but not often in, in in the UK, and then you've got the offensive line. So you've got two tackles, which are your outermost offensive linemen. Uh, you've got the left tackle on the left hand side, and and the right tackle on the right hand side. And then the two guys on the inside of the tackles are called guards. So you've got the left guard on the left hand side and the right and the right guard on the right hand side. And then right in the middle, the guy who touches the ball um, on every play, as well as the quarterback, is the centre. And the centre is the one who snaps the ball to the quarterback or, or whoever's going to receive the ball. Moving on to the actual positions, so if you think about the quarterback, you can see um, an image of our current starting quarterback, Ben Robinson. Um, the, there is a reason why a quarterback is called the most important position of all the sports, or, or at least uh, declared by those involved in American football. It's because they touch the ball on pretty much every offensive play. So whether it's handing off to the running back or throwing the ball forwards to a wide receiver or a running back or a tight end, uh, they, will, they will ultimately touch the ball on 99% of the plays. To be a successful quarterback, you need to have a strong arm. So you need to be able to throw the ball with velocity uh, because if you, if you throw the ball up there, it's easy, easily, um, easily caught by the, uh, by the defense. They need to be accurate. So they need to be able to throw the ball where it needs to go. Uh, and they also, uh, what also is very helpful for, for a quarterback is to have someone who's mobile. So it adds to the offense by being able to escape um, out of trouble. Or in the case of our quarterback in Ben, is that he is actually able to become a runner himself as well. And then there's actually some uh, non-physical traits that really go well with a quarterback. So someone who's really competitive, so a real desire to win, um, always helps in a quarterback. Um, intelligence, so needing to know the playbook inside and out, but also being able to understand what the defense is showing them so they can decide what's the best way to run the play. And then also vision. So it's not a, it's be, it's not just being able to see, but it's also be able to preempt what's going to happen. So it's seeing what's developing in front of them and also an ability to see the whole field. Then moving on to the running back. So the most important thing to mention about running backs is that they actually come in, um, running backs can come in many different shapes and size, sizes. So you can see pictured there is Laurent or LT, our, our starting court running back for quite a number of years now. Um, but, you know, he's one, one, uh, one size. There's plenty of other sizes out there as well. Uh, so if you consider the fact uh, some are some are quick and slippery, tough players to tackle in the open field. So a, a very a very good example of that is Barry Sanders uh, from the Detroit Lions. Um, and I would probably um, put uh, L, our our guy LT in that bracket as well. Some are bruises, so they're usually thicker, usually um, a little bit taller, um, and they're, they're there to deliver the hit to the defense. So if you if you consider you know the the jab that a boxer a boxer throws um, having a bruiser on on the team is very helpful so if you think about Derrick Henry for the Tennessee Titans right now he's a he's a, a prototypical uh, person in, in that category but then there are some people who are a bit of both so they're tough to bring down but they're also able to get behind their shoulder pads and deliver a hit to the defense so a good example of that you know there's plenty of them but a good example of that in today's game is Dalvin Cook um, the important thing to note about running backs is that they're every down players. So you, the concentration is really important for, for a running back. Uh, they can never take a rep off on offense because they're involved in some way, whether it is actually running the ball um, or whether it's running a route and um, to be able to catch a ball or to make the defense wrong or to protect the quarterback in pass protection. 
Moving on to the wide receivers. Um, so I'm not going to talk about tight ends because uh, we don't tend to use them in in um, in the at the Nighthawks. Uh, but the wide receivers, they're the pass catchers. They also differ very widely. And um, you can you can be a wide receiver and, and not look the same. And and certainly that tends to be the case for for a lot of our wide receiver core because we've got um, varying shapes and sizes on our, in our wide receiver core at the moment. Um, you have those that are quick uh, and those that are fast, and that they are different. We do we do refer to them as, uh, as as differently in American football. So quick is where you're able to get from one place to another quickly. Um, so that the, you've got short short distance burst, and then you've got those that are fast that are able to reach a a higher top speed than others who might be able to take the top off the defense. You've got the big bodied, so those that you might use in the end zone to try and body. Uh, try and be physical in the end zone where there's, short, where there's uh, not a lot of space and they come and wide receivers can be tall and small uh, depending on what they're used for. A wide receiver needs to be able to catch the ball efficiently so they need to be able to catch the ball they need to be able to run a route properly and then make make fast decisions so whether that be to to run with the ball to be able to catch and get down or run out run out of bounds if necessary and they need to be able to read a defense there are some times where a wide receiver is asked to run a run a route depending on what defense gives them but obviously being a wide receiver where you're catching the ball and leaving your body out there for a, def a defense a defensive guy to come and get you. Uh, toughness is also key. Wide receivers need to be courageous and be able to take the punishment because the chances are once you've caught that ball, there's someone coming to hit you at the end of it as well. And then onto the offensive line. So to quote Don Wu, um, one of our wide receivers, uh, there isn't an offense without an offensive line and the offensive line are the most important guys on an offense. Um, and I've already uh, highlighted you the five different positions on an offense, uh, on an offensive line. So uh, the center, the guards and the tackles. These are the big guys. So these are the guys who uh, are, are there to get in the way of the defensive line. They are the tend to be the strongest on the team uh, because they obviously need to be the unstop uh, the uh, immovable object in front of the unstoppable forces, um, and they are the workhorses who who um, don't have a glamorous role. Their their aim is to protect the quarterback and block for running backs. Um, so they do a lot of the a lot of getting their hands dirty, uh, hands in the mud, and uh, try and deal with the the dirty work there. A prototypical offensive lineman is someone who's strong, but agile and as well as intelligent. They need to know their blocking assignments on every play. A missed block can uh, result in a in a in a um, in a poor offensive um, play. So if you miss a block, you could lose yardage, um, or uh, just just as importantly, you can get your quarterback sacked, um, and that can have many many repercussions for an offense. Moving on to the defense, so I've highlighted again the line of scrimmage because that's important to understand where a defensive position um, plays uh, on the field. So if you take a look at the diagram, that is typical. That's a typical defense for the Nighthawks. So we have four defensive linemen, and they're the guys that line up at the line of scrimmage. So you can see on the on the uh, screen there, you can see S, E and W, E. So they're the defensive ends. So they're the guys who line up at the end, at the either end of the defense. Um, S stands for strong and W stands for weak. So we've got a strong end and a weak end and they and they tend to, to, to be the, the outermost parts of the defensive line. And you've got um, S, T and W, T there, which are our defensive tackles. They're the one. They're the guys who line up in the middle of the of the of the uh, defensive line, and which tends to be the middle of the offensive line as well. And then you've got the linebackers. So on this on this diagram in particular, you've got S, M, W, and R, and they refer to different linebackers. So you can see we've got four defensive linemen and then four linebackers. So we have S for Sam, M for Mike, W for Will, and R for Rover. Um, and all, what else you can see there in green are the defensive backs. So you've got the C's, which are the cornerbacks, so the guys who um, protect the perimeter. And then you've got um, a free safety, uh, which is um, our last line of defense on our defense. 
The defensive line are the guys who disrupt everything that the offense are trying to do. So defensive linemen um, are deployed to control the trenches. They're there to disrupt the passer and they're also to fill the holes that the offensive line are trying to make for the running back to get through. Um, depending on the type of lineman that you are, so if you're a defensive end, you tend to be quick. Um, you need to be strong because obviously you need to move, be able to move the big guys away from where they want to go on offensive line. They don't not, don't mind getting their noses dirty battling um, battling with those offensive line. The defensive ends tend to be tall and lengthy, so you find that the prototypical defensive end will be tall and then have really long arms because you can use that as leverage against the offensive line. And then you might find that in the middle, uh, the tackles, the defensive tackles tend to be a bit more stout because their their role mainly tends to be to, to block those holes for running backs get, trying to get through, um, although they can still be used, uh, can be deployed to get to the quarterback. You've got the linebackers, so uh, these tend to be the quarterbacks of the defense. So you'll find um, a lot of defensive captains are employed as linebackers and um, they, they need to read every play uh, because the linebackers tend to uh, tend to be the only the only part of the defense that are either going forward or backwards, depending on the play. And um, so they may drop into pass coverage or they may fill a hole in the run game. So they, they do require a bit of intelligence, um, certainly to try and read an offense to decide on where they're going next. Inside linebackers. Um, so if you imagine the wheels and the mics, so those that are in the middle of the field, they tend to be a bit more stouter than the outside linebackers uh, because they need to be able to fill the gaps and go against uh, offensive linemen and running backs that are coming through those holes. Um, they need to be able to move quickly, so short short yard dis, uh, quickness is really helpful because then you can you can fill you can make that read and do what you need to do quickly. And they, as I've mentioned, they also need to be intelligent to be able to read the game. If you consider outside linebackers, so that's the Sam and the Rover in out that I pointed out to you, uh, they tend to be quicker than inside linebackers uh, because they're more involved in the pass game. They do a lot of coverage of of um, of wide receivers, but they also need to have some sort of thickness on them because they need to provide support in the run game and take on offensive linemen as well as um, as well as running backs that are coming out of the backfield. If you consider quarterbacks, so uh, uh, sorry, cornerbacks, cornerbacks are those guys on the perimeters. They are pretty much built like like wide receivers because they need to be able to match up against them. They tend to be quick and fast. Uh, they need to be agile because they need to be able to change direction quickly because the wide receiver knows where they're going. You don't know where they're going m most of the time. So they, uh, to be able to cover a short um, distance and change position quickly uh, is really helpful for corner cornerbacks. They're rarely involved in the run game, but never say never. So being a good tackler um, is very helpful uh, for, to, for being a cornerback. Uh, but their primary role is to prevent wide receivers catching the ball. And then the last uh, position in our defense is the free safety. So another position of the defense that can't take a play off. And um, certainly uh, the free safety in our, in our defense needs to decide quickly whether it's going to be part of the run game or part of the of the pass game. Free safety needs to be as quick as a cornerback, but as useful in the run game as an outside linebacker. And tends to be someone who can cover a large amount of distance quickly. So uh, quickness and speed is good there. Um, they are the last line of defense in the pass game, uh, but they also provide force in the run game. So you can imagine that the, they might differ slightly from a cornerback on an outside linebacker. They'll be somewhere in the middle. They're usually thick in stature um, and able to, because they need to be able to take on a running back, but they also need to be quick and agile to be able to cover a wide receiver. So hopefully that's given you an idea of the, the different positions that are involved in American football. And, and hopefully by now you've kind of identified where you might find yourself fitting um, as in a position if you're new to the sport. What I want to do now is just to play a small video for you to talk about uh, the rules of American football um, and, the, the penal and some of the penalties that are involved in American football. Penalties in American football games can be confusing or controversial, even among longtime fans. But ironically, they're also generally pretty easy to follow for newer fans. So what do I mean by that? The nice thing for new football fans is that every time a foul is committed, 
the referee will stop the game and explain everything that happened as well as the consequences of the penalty. On the other hand, lots of penalties happen so quickly and there's such a fine line whether they were committed or not that people will often disagree on whether a call should have been made, which means the coverage of big penalties will often focus on slow motion replays on 4K screens. But we're not going to get into the minutia of the rules in this video. What we are going to look at is how a penalty is called, what are some of the most common penalties that you will see in a game, why would a team not want a penalty to be called, and what happens when there are multiple penalties during one play. So when a penalty is committed, one of the referees, and football games have seven referees who dress up like old-timey convicts, and any of them has the ability to call a penalty on each play. So one of these referees will call a penalty by throwing a flag which is only a real flag, it's just this little yellow thing that they throw onto the field. And this is a visual signal so that everyone can see that they've called a penalty, because obviously trying to yell wouldn't work so well. When the head referee sees a flag, he'll go over to the ref who threw it and try to figure out the situation. And then he will turn on his microphone and make an announcement where he'll say something like, false start, number 65 of the offense, this is a five-yard penalty, replay first down. So he's giving the why the foul was called, who committed it, which team it was against, what the consequences are, and what down it is now. So even if you don't understand what the actual penalty was or why it was committed, you will at least be able to pick up on the new down and yardage to go. There's also usually a hand motion that he'll make for every penalty. So if you're at a high school game rather than watching it on TV and the referee doesn't have a microphone, then you'll still learn those pretty quickly and you can pick up on what the penalty is. Usually the punishment for a foul is the loss of yardage, typically 5, 10, or 15 yards. And if it's on the offense, then most of the time, whatever down it was on the play is repeated. And if it's on the defense, then sometimes the offense will get an automatic first down, so they can be a little harsher on the defense like that. So let's take a look at some of the most common penalties you'll see in a game and their consequences. So false start is actually something that will occur before the play even starts. Now, as all the players come up to the line of scrimmage, which is where the ball is, the defensive players have no set position. They can move around to wherever they want to. But once the offense is set, then they cannot move until the ball is snapped, unless they're shifting or going in motion. So a false start will be called when one of the offensive players moves before the snap. And usually it's no more than just a small little flinch. Now, this rule can sound kind of confusing to explain because players on the line can still turn their heads and things, and that's fine but usually you'll recognize a false start after you see a few examples. When this happens, the referees will throw their flags and blow their whistles to stop the play before it's even started. And the head referee will announce false start and note that it's a loss of five yards. So they'll move the ball back five yards and replay the down. So instead of being first down and 10 yards to go, now it will be first down and 15. The defensive equivalent to false start is encroachment. So while the defensive players can move, they cannot touch any of the players on the offense. This would be a five-yard penalty against the defense. Again, this is before the play even starts. This can also lead to situations where a defensive player will take a step over the line of scrimmage, realize he's messed up, and then quickly jumps back to his side of the ball. As long as no offensive players move, then the play will continue. But a defensive player cannot jump in an offensive player on purpose to try to make him false start. Going off sides can happen to either team. This just means that you are positioned on or past the line of scrimmage when the ball is snapped, and that's also a five-yard penalty. Another pre-snap penalty is delay of game. So if you're watching on TV, this is usually a pretty easy one to spot because they'll have the play clock on the screen, and if the offense does not snap the ball when the clock gets to zero, then that's a five-yard penalty for delay of game. So let's get to some penalties that actually take place during a play. A holding penalty could be called against either team, but usually it's against an offensive lineman who are trying to stop the defenders who are trying to tackle the quarterback. So holding is a 10 yard penalty from the spot of the foul. So if the line of scrimmage is at the 35 and the player is held at the 30, then the offense would be moved back to the 20 for the next play. A face mask penalty can be called on either team for grabbing the face mask of another player's helmet and pulling or twisting it. Now, obviously, pulling someone's face mask could lead to a serious injury, like even more so than the rest of playing football, which is pretty much a guarantee you'll get injured somehow. But this one has a rule against it. And it's a big one because a face mask penalty will cost your team 15 yards. So roughing the passer can be a tricky one because the rules changed a lot just a few years ago, but players now have seemed to have adjusted, and it doesn't happen as much as it used to now. 
roughing the passer is using excessive force against the quarterback. And typically this occurs when the defense is rushing in to try to tackle him and he waits until the last second to throw the ball. Now, obviously, you cannot hit the quarterback if he doesn't have the ball. But if you're running full speed to try to tackle him, you won't exactly be able to stop your momentum instantly if he lets go of the ball right before you hit him. So the question then becomes how much time between the release of the ball and the hit is acceptable, which is a bit of a gray area. And this is one of those deals where it can lead to some disagreements over whether a call should or should not be made. Other parts of this include that if a quarterback has thrown the ball, you cannot land on top of him with your full weight. And it's also a no-no to ever hit the quarterback in the head. Roughing the passer is also a big one with a 15-yard penalty and an automatic first down for the offense. So roughing the passer is similar to roughing the kicker or the punter. A field goal and punt plays will often involve defensive players running in at full speed to try and block a kick, which may result in them running into a kicker. So unless the punter really messes up and bobbles the ball, really here you're trying to go for the ball, not actually trying to tackle the kicker. So the penalty for doing so is a 15-yard penalty with an automatic first down, although there's also a five-yard penalty version for less egregious times when a defender accidentally runs into the kicker. One penalty that could lead to a lot of yardage gained is pass interference, which can either be on the offense or the defense, but is probably more commonly committed by the defense. So once the quarterback throws the ball, the defender cannot touch the receiver. Now, touch is used kind of loosely in this case. It's more that he cannot impede the receiver's path to the ball by grabbing, holding, tripping, tackling, giving him a wet willy, something like that. So in the NFL, the penalty for defensive pass interference is that the ball was actually placed at the spot where the foul took place, which could potentially be like 70 yards up the field. So this can be a major gain of yards for the offense. In college and high school football, the penalty is just 15 yards, even if the foul took place beyond that. And that, that's also the case here where it's um, 15 yards in, um, in the UK as well. I think I've just accidentally lost our spot. So we should go back. Situation, what happens if there is defensive interference in the end zone or really any foul that would result in moving an offense into the end zone? Do they get a free touchdown? And no, they do not. There are no free touchdowns in football or any automatic scoring for that matter. What would happen if there is pass interference committed in the end zone is that the ball is automatically placed on the one yard line, which while it's not a guaranteed score, it's about as close as you can get. Now, I'm not going to run through every different foul and scenario, but just so you are aware, there are also maybe times where a team is close to the end zone and a foul is committed, that rather than that team getting the usual number of yards, the ball would be moved half the distance to the goal line from where they are, rather than being placed on the one yard line. So next, let's look at a situation that might arise where it would actually hurt a team to have a penalty called on the other team, which may sound odd, but here's an example. So the offense has the ball on their own 10 yard line and they hand off and the running back rushes for 30 yards. So it's a pretty nice game, but there's a call of defensive holding back at the line of scrimmage. So if that penalty were to take effect, then they would get 10 yards and an automatic first down from the line of scrimmage rather than the 30 yards that they gained on the play. So in this case, the referee will go to the offense and he will ask, do you want to accept this penalty? And the offense will say, no, we want to decline the penalty. And the referee will still make his announcement you know, holding defense number 69. And then he'll say the penalty is declined. So as a result of the play, the ball will be placed at the 40 yard line first down. So the final thing is what happens if there are multiple penalties on the same play? What happens then? If they are both on the same team, then generally only the one that will benefit the other team the most is applied. So if the defense was caught both holding and committing pass interference, then whichever penalty would move the offense further up the field will count. Unfortunately for the offense, they are not added together. Now, if there are penalties on both teams, then in almost all cases, the penalties will offset, meaning they cancel each other out and they will just have a do-over from the previous down and spot and act like it never happened. But luckily, both for new and old fans, as always, the referee will explain everything so everyone gets back on the same page again.
Okay, so I uh, hope you found that useful and um, that'll introduce you to the basic rules that are involved in um, American football. Uh, so from, from now, uh, thanks for listening. Uh, hopefully that was helpful to introduce you to the game of American football and also give you an idea of, of the positions involved and, and hopefully by now you've had, got an idea of where you might fit within the team. But at the same time, still don't, don't worry uh, when we when we get you into your first day um, with us in practice it'll take you a few more uh, a few training sessions to understand where you might fit and certainly for the coaches to understand where you might fit and we'll we'll get you there uh, when you uh, when you're up and running um, but for now look out for more uh, for uh, dates for the taste sessions dates for um, practices uh, we'll also start uploading more resources for you. Uh, but for now, thank you very much for listening and I hope that was useful. Speak again soon.